everyone and welcome to What is Quantum? I'm Kim and I'm the Program Manager for Research and Innovation at the University of Bristol and also the Centre Manager of the Quantum Technology Enterprise Centre. We're absolutely thrilled that you can join us today which is the first of our quantum sessions at the Bristol Technology Festival this week. We've got a jam-packed session for you today starting with an introduction to quantum technologies from our guest speakers Dr Ewan Allen who's a research fellow at the University of Bristol and Dr Araceli Venegas Gomez who's the founder of Coreca. After this session, we'll be finding out more about Bristol's quantum ecosystem from Professor Noah Linden and from some of the Bristol-based quantum technology startups themselves. Afterwards, we'll hold a panel session discussing the difficulties of commercialising quantum technologies before our final networking session in the social lounge. So we really want this event to be as interactive as possible, so you can react throughout the session by sending us a thumbs up or a smiley face by clicking on the emoji button at the bottom of the screen. Or if you have a question, you can pop it in the chat box on the right hand side bar or during the Q&A, we'll be inviting some of our audience to the stage to ask their question live. So you can get involved in this session by clicking the raise the hand button later on during the Q&A sessions. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Ewan Allen, who will kick off the session by telling us what is quantum. Thank you, Kim. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for coming on today. Um, as Kim said, yeah, I'm, I'm Ewan Allen. I'm a researcher uh, at the University of Bristol in the Quantum Engineering Technology Labs. Um, and I'm going to try and answer today what is quantum uh, with the help of Arathelli. Um, and I'm yeah, initially going to talk about the kind of science and the technology, maybe a bit more, and Arathelli maybe will focus on the industry aspects of it. Um, also, just for complete transparency, I, I also work with for um, this company, Siliton, who, who will be uh, pitching later. So yeah, I've got my feet in, in, two com in two companies today, but I'm teaching about quantum science, so it's mostly the University of Bristol, my role there. So here's the team uh, that I work with. Uh, this is the, the General Ket Labs. This is part of a wider quantum research effort in Bristol in the Quantum Institute, which Noah will discuss later. This is mostly uh, hardware-based research, so we're mostly doing experiments. We're based generally in the physics building, which is this beautiful building um, at the top of the hill in Bristol. And we do optics mostly, which I'll discuss later, but it, we have experiments that mostly look like this or, or there, there and thereabouts. So we're about a group of 100 people. 100 researchers, uh, all, all focused towards quantum technology and engineering challenges that come with that. So what will I discuss today? We're going to tackle the what is quantum question very briefly. Uh, I'll then talk through maybe a bit of history uh, and some uh, some labeling that is given to quantum technologies, this quantum 1.0 and quantum 2.0 discussion to maybe give you an idea of where we're at at the moment and why there's perhaps the hype behind quantum that there is. I'll then briefly mention some quantum technologies that there are. I'll try and give you uh, five minutes of quantum photonics if I have time, uh, and then just mention some other quantum platforms that people are using for, to build quantum technologies as well. So that's, that's the outline that we'll go through. So the big question of today uh, and of this session really is, is what is quantum? Um, if I was being totally honest, the answer would be that I don't really know. It's a pretty hard, hard thing to answer, and there's lots of different answers you could give. Um, I'm going to try and give what I think might be uh, one way to go, but I'm sure there's lots of people that would maybe have a different definition. So, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. So one way you could do it is you could look up. So this is from uh, the European Quantum Technologies Roadmap. This is a publicly available a piece of literature that kind of outlines the European focus of quantum research. And you can look at a word map of what that document contains. Obviously, it contains things like quantum systems. And often we compare with these things called classical systems, which is you know, systems that don't have access to quantum features. Um, a big part of the research effort is control. So I'll show you what this kind of means later. Um, and we have applications, so things like simulation and computing, and somewhere there's, there we go, communication is at the top here. Um, so all these applications and qubits we'll also discuss later and things like entanglement. So you see lots of quantum words, um, but also some classical ones as well. Some, some words you'll be familiar with, things like control, challenges, you know, algorithms. So it's kind of uh, 
it's not always just quantum stuff that comes up, comes up in these things. Um, maybe to give a bit more context, I'll just give you a, a laser, uh, <clears throat> sorry, lightning quick uh, summary of the history of quantum. So quantum kind of first appeared right, you know, 100 years ago, um, where uh, the foundations of quantum theory and quantum mechanics kind of came out as a scientific theory of physics, theory of physics. Uh, led by lots of uh, lots of people, lots of who went to this famous con conference, this uh, Solvay conference in 1912, um, led to things and theoretical and experimental descriptions of things like the photoelectric effect, so the thing that Einstein won his Nobel Prize for, um, quantized energy levels in, in things like atoms, uh, so the idea that you can have discrete energy levels, whereas um, rather than a continuous spectrum, which was what was believed prior to quantum theory. Maybe some familiar concepts, so Schrodinger's equation or Schrodinger's cat, these were where these ideas were developed in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It led to lots of uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, lots of kind of really fundamental scientific theories. Uh, it was all kind of developed around this time, up to the 30s, but also later on as well. So this was kind of where the, the real scientific theory was developed. And that led to, um, you know, about it took, it took a while, but it led to some really kind of groundbreaking tools being developed from this theory. Things that use this quant idea of quantized energy levels, the idea that energy comes in discrete packets. Kind of the most famous is probably the laser and, and light emitting diodes, of which I think all of us, even maybe even today, have used one of these two things. Um, and yeah, this is an early development of a laser. This is a CO2 laser. They don't look like this anymore. Um, I wish they did because they look very cool. But um, yeah, so we saw from, from the foundational quantum mechanics, this kind of understanding of the theory, we actually were able to build some useful tools, which are now completely widespread and, and, and you know, across many industries uh, and applications. Maybe the next step you might look at is kind of um, a slightly more kind of theoretical work in, in quantum, maybe looking at some of the finer features, more exotic features. So this was in, in the 60s, we had something called Bell's theorem by, by John Bell, this, uh, this guy from Northern Ireland who, who um, developed a theory that, that was really just showing that quantum mechanics was something different, uh, I guess, from, so Einstein proposed this idea that maybe we just don't really understand quantum mechanics. And if we did, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that much different from what we knew before. Um, but he, he showed there's a way that we can test for this and show that quantum really is uh, more than just a lack of our understanding of, of, of the universe. Um, and that took, you know, 20 years really to actually experimentally show that you can do this test that Bell developed. Uh, and Alan Aspect was the person who led that, that first experiment of the Bell test. I include Alan um, because I think he has the best. If you ask the question, what is the best mustache in quantum? I think Alan probably probably wins, um, but yeah, he was he was perhaps the first to do the first Bell test. There was also this other test that was done perhaps a bit before, but it's uh, it's up to you which one you pick. And we also saw initial indications of kind of first mentions of quantum technology. So uh, Menin and Feynman, maybe you know, just in the early eighties, started to talk about the possibility of using quantum systems to do computations or simulations that maybe. Uh, that maybe we can't do, or, or the reason, you know, if, if something is quantum that you're trying to simulate, then why wouldn't you use a quantum system? Is, is kind of Feynman's, Feynman's point. Um, and so we kind of just start to see this early development of the ideas that maybe quantum is, is a bit more than what we think of uh, maybe prior to, prior to this era. We then saw some big quantum technology steps in terms of the theory. Um, so we saw, and again, sorry, I should emphasize this is a very yeah high level I'm missing lots of stuff out, but I think it gives you an idea of where we're at. Um, we saw, yeah, the first quantum key distribution protocol proposed in 84. So uh, this is the idea that you can uh, use quantum states to actually send information and share a key between two parties securely. And you'd want to do this because then those two parties can communicate um, securely. And so the first pro proposal of how to do that using quantum uh, was given in 84. And then uh, Peter Shaw had had two pretty big contributions to, to quantum science. So this is first he introduced this prime, Shaw's algorithm, so this prime factoring algorithm, uh, showing that a quantum computer can efficiently compute the prime factors of a number. 
Uh, and this was uh, pretty groundbreaking because it showed kind of rigorously that um, quantum computing can take a, a problem which is known to be difficult to solve on a classical computer and can solve it in, a, in a, an efficient manner. Um, and so it was the first insight that actually quantum computers may be able to tackle some of the big problems that we have in, in computing more generally. And then the year after, he showed that actually um, you can do also do quantum error correction. So this is the idea that um, if you have bits in a computer, in your, you know, your classical laptop, your normal laptop, then often those bits uh, can have some errors to them. So they're not quite, they won't quite stay in the states that you want them to stay in. Um, and so you need to do some correction to those errors. In quantum, that's a bit more difficult. And for a long time, people weren't sure that you could do it. Uh, Peter Shaw showed you code. And therefore, uh, it kind of paved the way uh, theoretically to show that you, you can build larger and larger quantum systems and you can correct errors that happen in them, which means you can do bigger and bigger computations. So you kind of showed, showed the way forward in terms of, uh, of building these, these systems and at least uh, hinted that it might be possible to build them. And so those big developments in theory were kind of led by big steps and experiments. So over the last 20 years, we've seen a whole range of qubit platforms, quantum systems, quantum platforms emerge. We've seen superconducting qubits, which I'll mention briefly later. We saw, so at the uh, at LIGO, this uh, gravitational, wave uh, uh, gravitational wave observatory, where you know recently we saw observations of gravitational wave, they are now implementing quantum light within their interferometer because it improves their sensitivity. So it allows them to detect smaller signals, and actually that what that converts to for them is means the the area or the distance which they can observe uh, these big black hole mergers has increased. So by implementing and using quantum technology, they've improved their sensor. And we've had now, yeah, also satellite uh, QKD. So this is a communication between a ground station and a satellite using quantum states and doing this key sharing, which I, which was first mentioned in, in the 80s. So you've seen, yeah, rapid development of technology. Um, now, huge, large scale experiments, both in LIGO, which is a, so this gravitational wave observatory is four kilometers long in two directions. So it's huge. And um, satellite QKD. So there's been lots of progress, and I mean, I just I put Michel Simmons here. So Michel is a is a, a leader in in silicon based quantum uh, bits, so a qubit qubit based systems, and uh, just to get an idea of the kind of importance that is seen in in these quantum technologies now, she was uh, I think voted or or or, or, uh, or given the, the the honor of Australian of the year last year or the year before. Uh, for our work in, in quantum generating these quantum platforms. So it's really it's really starting to uh, to kick off in terms of uh, the kind of uh, interest in, in quantum and the technology itself in particular. And then maybe lastly, just because it might be, if you've heard of one thing about quantum technology, it might be this result. It's the, uh, the Google quantum computing result where for the first time they showed using this, so this is the Google Sycamore chip. It's a superconducting chip. Um, they showed for the first time that you can build a quantum computer that can outperform a classical computer um, for a very particular experiment. So they compared this chip with a supercomputer, uh, and for a very particular problem, this chip was able to, to perform a, the computation and compute the answer faster than the classical supercomputer. So it's a big milestone in, in quantum computing in particular. Um, so uh, yeah, and people often show this image, which is the chip, which is cool and it's pretty. Uh, as an experimentalist, though, I like to show the inside the cryostat. So this is superconducting. So this thing is actually what is going on in the background. The chip sits somewhere in between this mess of wires. Um, and this this bottom stage here is probably a, a few millikelvin. So that's minus 273 degrees Celsius, about as cold as you can get. Um, and all these wires, so you can see all these can these wires here, and that's the control. So we saw that massive in that word map, the big word control. Uh, and this is the kind of control we're talking about. So in order, to, in order to perform operations on those qubits and also read out from those qubits, those states um, that we need, you need an awful lot of control. And this is actually, I think, from an experimentalist point of view in quantum at the moment, this would say, this would, they would say this is the big challenge is, is how do you control these quantum systems to the point where you can build useful technology. And sometimes that's 
sometimes straightforward and, and sometimes it's not. And in this case, it, it's actually a very complex problem to get all these controls in and out of the cryostat. Um, so that's a very, very quick overview of, of um, quantum over the last 100 years. And I, I guess the emphasis I want to make is that it's always been a, a, a kind of a, a two match between developing theory and uh, an understanding of quantum mechanics and technology, and then experimentalists then building that technology and finding useful things to do with it and actually demonstrating that it works. And it's kind of always this push pole between this uh, theoretical understanding and this experimental engineering aspect. So both things are kind of tugging against each other. Um, if we talk about, so you, you often hear some people talk about quantum 1.0 and quantum 2.0 with reference to saying that now we're in the kind of quantum 2.0 era. And what people mean by this is that by quantum 1.0, they, they mostly are talking about this kind of uh, early 60s and later development where uh, people were really building and utilizing systems that um, uh, measure or use discrete aspects of atoms or light. So things like lasers or single photon detectors, detectors where you can measure single quantum particles of light, quanta. Um, and this is really seen as 1.0. And if you go to quantum 2.0 systems, it's maybe uh, systems or, or technologies that utilize more exotic effects, things like superposition, which I'll, I'll cover in a second. Other things like entanglement, uncertainty principle, this thing called squeezing. These are kind of slightly more uh, subtle uh, uh, and fine-tuned quantum effects, which uh, is kind of the focus more of this latter half of the century uh, work, and especially recent work. This is kind of uh, where lots of the effort has been. Uh, and so you'll see today companies, and you know around the world, there'll be companies that kind of fit in this quantum 2.0 uh, region and also some some companies that fit in just this quantum 1.0 region and and everything in between and i guess my point with this slide is just to just to say that actually these things are kind of symbiotic um they're they're kind of one and the same because they need each other really i think uh what we're finding is that uh recent you know recent even though the laser was out you know in the in the 60s um it, they're still lots of development happening in, in laser science and laser physics and laser engineering. And so technology development in those discrete quantis, uh, quantized systems is actually driving innovation and applications in quantum 2.0. So it's enabling us to build these finer tuned systems because we're engineering quantum 1.0 systems, which are good enough to, to kind of achieve these, these uh, effects. And similarly, actually, we're finding that uh, quantum 2.0, so we're developing new applications, uh, and those applications, um, which were previously unknown, are, are kind of desired enough that they're actually driving technology development in quantum 1.0 systems. So we're seeing this kind of feedback effect where you find a good application, you then develop the system to actually perform that application, and then that develops, that allows you to do another application as well, and you get this kind of continuous feedback loop. So uh, this is why there's been, I think, some you know real rapid development of, in the last 20 years in, in quantum technology in particular. So what do we mean by quantum technology? So I've already spoken about this briefly, but this is also quite focused towards Bristol's research, but I'm going to up front show my bias here. So uh, one thing you can do with quantum technology is you can do secure communications. That's through mostly two means. One is through this QKD, this quantum key distribution, and you'll see companies today discuss this. But this is the idea that you can share a key between two parties uh, using quantum states, usually of light. Um, uh, and you actually, it, 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 it allows security, which isn't just derived from mathematical hardness, it's actually uh, based on kind of the, these quantum effects, this uncertainty effect. Another thing is that you, quantum allows you to, so quantum is uncertain in general. The theory shows that there's some uncertainty um, and you can actually use this uncertainty to generate random numbers. So you get this thing called QRNG, quantum random numbers. Another thing you can do, which is maybe perhaps the best known application is, is computing and simulation. So this is an idea that you can either build, <clears throat> you can build uh, hardware, quantum hardware, which allows you to do certain types of computation uh, more efficiently um, or it allows you to simulate other quantum systems so this might be things like simulating uh, drugs uh, uh, 
for, for drug trials or for this example that I showed earlier, this Shor's algorithm allows you to compute these mathematically hard problems, which for a classical, classical computer would just take too long to do otherwise. It's also um, just interesting generally for science and hardware. So there's still lots of science that people are doing with these quantum systems. It's still, you know, what is quantum is still a question that people are continuously trying to answer. And so uh, there's still lots of fundamental research going on as well. And also another key area is sensing and imaging. So this is the idea that by allowing yourself to have access to these quantum features, particularly maybe these quantum 2.0 features, you're actually able to build sensors and cameras and images which operate either with some kind of precision or sensitivity enhancement, which you which you wouldn't have got to before. So they're allowing you to build better sensors, basically. And these are maybe the, the four main areas that people are kind of building quantum technology and research for. Um, okay, so now I'm going to give a very quick whirlwind. I've got five minutes left, and we're going to uh, try and do some physics because I'm a physicist at the end of the day. Um, so I'm just going to try and take you from classical to quantum computing to give you an idea of where this advantage is coming from and what this actual quantum feature is doing. So for classical computing, you have bits and qubits. This is the base. You know, if you strip everything back in your in your laptop, this is basically what's going on. You have a bit which can either be a zero or a one, and you have things called gates. And this is operations on the bit. So you have this thing called an AND gate, where if you have a one if you, it takes in two bits, and if it's a one and a one, it's a not and. So this would be a zero at the output. And every other configuration, so a zero, 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 one, one, zero, would give you a one at the output. And this is just a way of taking in bits and outputting a different bit. But it turns out, and you can prove this, that if you have access to bits and this gate, then you can build a computer. This is all you need. This is kind of a fundamental operation of a computer. You just build bits and NAND gates in different configurations, and you can construct any bit string input to any output, um, which is which is really cool. The, uh, the converse for us is qubits, quantum bits, and quantum gates. So you'll see this thing called qubits, which are usually represented on a sphere, which I won't go into why that is, but they normally, again, it's a zero and a one. From a qubit, you will only measure a zero and a one from an output, but we put these little uh, brackets, the rack notation around this. This really, uh, for now, could just signify that it's quantum. And we also have quantum gates. So we have things called a Hadamard gate, and we have a phase gate, and we have a whole range. And actually, you can, you can also compute gate sets where you can do everything that a quantum com computer can do. You need slightly more than these two. Um, but it's the same principle. You get access to qubits. If you can build a qubit, you're good. If you can do these gates, then you can build a quantum computer. And that's what you need. So how do I actually encode a qubit? Well, I talked about what we do photonics in Bristol. So actually what you might say is if I have a photon in a top path, I call it a zero. And if I have a photon in the bottom path, I call it a one. And that's just how we do our computation. I can do things called a beam, so beam splitting operations. So I can insert a beam splitter here. And that basically is just a, a half silvered mirror where half, Half of the time, this photon is going to go bounce off of it, and half the time, it's going to go through this, this mirror. <clears throat> so actually, if you looked at the output, if you sent this photon through and you said, oh, I'm going to input a zero, what does this beam splitter do to my logical qubit? And actually, you just get 50% of the time, it's a zero, and 50% of the time, it's a one. So if it, half the time, it comes out at the top, half the time, it comes out at the bottom, like I said. You can do something a bit more exotic, maybe, and you can send it through this beam splitter twice. So you can send it through once, do what we did, and then send it through another one. Exactly the same operation. And what you might expect is that this first, you know, the options of things that can happen is this thing can bounce off twice and end up at the top. It can go through twice and end up at the top again. Or it can bounce off once and go through or go through and bounce off. Um, and those two times end up at the bottom. And so you might expect that at the output, if I was to measure how many times it's a zero and how many times it's a one, top and bottom, I'd get 50-50. Uh, this isn't what happens at all. Uh, you get all of the photons. So if you send one photon in at a time, every single time it will come out at the top row, uh, which should be quite striking uh, because you know 
following it through as we expect, it should end up like this. And what's going on is, uh, is basically uh, the photon doesn't really actually make a decision at the time whether it goes topple uh, through the top rail or the bottom rail. It, it, goes, it starts beginning to act like a wave. And this is where the quantum effects uh, become apparent. And it actually goes through this interferometer acting like a wave. And it turns out that like the same way where if the peak of a wave, a water wave meets the, the trough of another wave, it, they cancel out and they actually end up with no wave at all. These bottom two conditions, uh, these bottom two paths end up doing the same thing. So the wave-like aspect of this photon, this, which is this superposition principle, this is, uh, end up causing these bottom two uh, possible ways of the photon coming out actually interfering destructively. So they cancel each other out. And so this quantum effect is actually leading to this wave-like interference, and it's causing this photon to always come out of the top rail. Uh, you can add in a thing called a phase shifter here, and you can actually tune whether it always comes out of the top, whether it's sometimes, you know, you get back the 50-50 that you had before, or whether it always comes out the bottom. So I can actually control this quantum-like interference as well using this phase shifter. And actually, I spoke about a Hadamard gate and a phase gate earlier as quantum gates. These are a Hadamard and a phase gate. So if I was to take this physical quantum photonic circuit and show you what it looked like in a computational circuit, it would look like this. So I'm just taking my qubit and I'm forming operations on it to define uh, the state that my photon is in. And so this is really how you start to get from technology, the fundamental engineering, the photonics, to the, to the computing. And just to say that if you start cascading these things up, um, you get more kind of striking effects where if this thing was acting how you would expect classically, you'd get this Gaussian output. So if I put a photon in and it went through lots of these beam splitters and lots of these phase shifters, you end up with most of the photons coming out in the middle. And if you allow yourself quantum effects, you get this uh, output distribution. So most of them actually end up at the edges. Um, and so you can see that this thing is allowing you to have features which you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So it's giving you more tools to play with. And this is where the advantage for computation comes in. It's basically giving you access to more exotic effects. And actually, you can use those for your benefit in, in quantum computing. Again, just before I run out of time, I already have slightly, but um, we uh, in Bristol, we're focused. You can build these using these photonic circuit. This is actually these beam splitters here. What we're focusing in Bristol is making these small. So you need lots of these beam splitters to build a quantum computer. And so we're taking these large scale devices and we're shrinking them onto integrated quantum photonic circuits. So this is now using silicon processing that you would otherwise use in your computer chip now. Other platforms, briefly, uh, that you might see quantum computing for and other, other technologies, uh, superconducting qubits, most prominently used by Google and IBM, and things like this. This is very cold. Um, similarly, you can, can, can trap ions in an electric field and manipulate those, and you get quantum effects. So this is using charged particles and the spin of those charged particles. And also, you can actually get solid state systems as well. So things in silicon or in diamond, where uh, you can actually see quantum effects to do with the electrons moving within that. And these are all platforms that people are, are using. So maybe just some take-home thoughts for you today. Uh, Quantum's been around for a while, but new applications are kind of just at, or just past even, the point of reaching industry. So it's quite an exciting time, I think, to, to be involved. And it's why the hype we're seeing is kind of coming around. Quantum offers new tools that can enhance a number of technologies. It's not always true, but it is often true. Um, an example of your cases, which I've come, come across, is, is communications, computation, and sensing. And with that, I'd like to say thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me on any of these, these outputs. Thanks so much, Ewan. As Ewan mentioned, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat box and um, we're going to get Aristelle to load up her slides and she'll be doing the next section. Can you see them? Perfect. Okay, 
Cool. So thank you very much, Kim. Um, and I'm really happy to be here because normally we are talking to scientists and people who are already part of quantum. So it's very exciting to talk about quantum to people who are not yet part of the quantum family, let's say. And Ian has given a very nice introduction about the history of quantum, how we ended up with a new technology. And I'm going to give you a little bit more overview of where we are right now in how we can use this technology to really in different use cases, different kind of business sectors, how is the landscape around the world, and why it's important when we think about skills for these. So if we think about any kind of new technology or any technology in general, you have the people working in academia, the people working on, on the research, the fundamental science, and how it works is we develop this science into new technology and it's going to create a new industry. But we also have the people already in the industry who are going to use this new technology. Now, if we also think about how all this is fun, we have the government and the funding agencies who are putting the money onto the research, onto the science, then the science is going to be developed to create new technology. And then we have the general public, people perhaps like yourself who are interested in these and they want to know what it's all about. And sometimes the information that you get out there, let's say, is a little bit mi misleading. But so far, this is what you find for any kind of technology. So what is different when we talk about quantum technologies? Well, as we have seen before, quantum is different. It's just based on different kind of phenomena. It's just, it's just very cool. We know that. And I think this kind of weirdness, nerdiness, or kind of a different kind of words that we don't normally use is what is making that quantum technologies has this kind of fastiness about it and what people sometimes call the hype about, about all that. But we know it, we know the, the phenomena, and um, Ewan has given you a, an overview, we know that the, these fancy phenomena, we know how to control them. I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but just again, why is quantum different? Because the phenomena at the quantum scale of matter, at the time levels of when we think about atoms, photons, we have different kind of phenomena. We have different kind of mathematics to work with that. And that's what all that we use now is based on these kind of phenomena. But one important message here is that we already use quantum mechanics, quantum technology every day. Because over the last, I guess, 50 years or more, we have already developed, or people have developed technology that is based on quantum mechanics. We have, we have transistors that are in all computers, in all your phones, and this is based on, on, the, on the quantum tunneling effect. We have lasers that is based on how we control photons. We have um, photo detectors in, in cameras. MRI, like magnetic resonance imaging, is based on quantum mechanics effects on spins. So what is actually different when we are talking now about a new kind of technology that everybody is, uh, is talking about new quantum technology is the fact that in the last decades, instead of having a bunch of atoms, a bunch of photons, now we really have this control at the single particle level, at the single atom, at the single photon. And this is really what is making this technology difference. And as Ewan said, we are entering in a new quantum revolution. That's this uh, quantum 2.0 that, that we heard about before. Yes, uh, we have different kind of technology. And I always mention these again and again, because sometimes you go into, into the media and what you find is quantum computing. And it's not just quantum computing. There are different kind of technology. And I'm going to give you a little bit more like clear examples how we use this technology in, in the different sectors. When we think about quantum computing, what we need to know is that this is a, this is a long term solution. So we need to wait years until we actually have a quantum computer that we can claim is a full tolerance quantum computer, which means we have a lot of qubits, as you mentioned, and we know that there is no error and we can do crazy things with it, probably things that we don't even know that we can do with it. It's like we are in the 40s, in the last century, when the computers were very large, they were as, as big as a room, and they didn't know that we would have a computer right now in our pocket. So we are there with quantum computing. But the, the good thing about and the development of quantum computers is that we know how this is going to develop in the, in the next years. And there is already a strategy for how we are going to develop the hardware and the software at the same time. And that's why it's so important and people are talking about already, because there are companies, there are scientists working on 
developing the software, developing solutions at the same time that other companies, other researchers are working on developing the hardware. And we know that even with a bunch of qubits, with a very little number of qubits, you can already have a solution that is better than if you use a classical computer. And there are really clear examples on, on different kind of sectors, different businesses, and I'm going to give you a little overview about that. But before that, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the other kind of technology. So when we talk about quantum communication, and Ian has mentioned how this works, how can we use it? So, so far, when you think about public key infrastructure, so any kind of transaction that is based on, on a key that it has to be secure, anything that has to do with um, transactions with, with banks, bank, bank transfers, or how very valuable data is stored, or even how these, um, these uh, digital signatures like blockchain work. All these is based on very secure keys. Now, how are we sure that these keys are secure? We know because there is a mathematical problem that has to be solved in order that you can break that security in your key. And this is based on the, on the multiplication of two prime numbers. Okay, but... The thing is that we already know that if one day we have a full tolerance quantum computer, there is already an algorithm that could break this kind of problem. This, like it could give you a solution to this problem very quickly, which means that all security that we have right now based on these mathematical problems, this could be broken very easily with a quantum computer. But don't worry, because we know at the same time that there are different kinds of technology, quantum technology, and also quantum algorithms that we know already that if we have a quantum computer, we we uh, we will have a security in our data, nevertheless. So we we know the risk, but we also have a solution. And yeah, there is a big market for this, and this is why we need to think about not only the things that we know that we could do with quantum computer. It's also what it will imply in other technologies. And I think this is this is very very important. And there are a lot of end users working already on these. Do we? from healthcare to, to financial systems, uh, everything is gonna be at risk with a quantum computer, but it's good, again, that this development is done, is done at the same time, that everybody's on the same boat and that we can work with any users already thinking about this new infrastructure of quantum communication can, can be de developed. Then quantum sensors, I really love to, when, when I talk about quantum sensors and, and ES has, uh, has given you the, technical background of it. But I want to give you clear examples of how this can be used. And sometimes examples that I don't think that we never thought of. So there are examples of how to use magnetometers. So you measure um, the, the magnetic field, right? This is a magnetometer. Now, if you measure how the, the heart rate in cows with these magnetometers, you are able to measure how happy the cows are. So if, if you have happy cows, they will give you more milk. And the dairy industry is huge. Only in UK, I, I don't remember exactly the number, but it's just huge. So the dairy industry can benefit from quantum sensing. And this, this is already a project that is under development. And I think that it could be, it could be developed all over the world. So you, you can imagine happy cows is something that you will never imagine that it could involve quantum technologies. And then on, on healthcare, of course, so you can measure the waves in the brain. So the magnetic fields in the brains are very, very weak. So if we are able to measure this very accurately, we will be, we will be closer to have a solution to, um, to diseases uh, like Alzheimer and, and other very, um, let, let's say diseases where we don't have a solution yet. So it's, it's something that is under development, but it's uh, very, very important that we put efforts on it. Then about navigation, I've been talking to people thinking about how to create a GPS uh, that is based on quantum sensors, but may, having a map of the, um, of the minerals that you have uh, around the Earth. So by knowing the, the magnetic fields, on, because you have a map of the minerals that you have underground on the Earth, then you know where you are on the Earth. I think this is absolutely fantastic. And um, again, the, the applications can be not only not only for oil and gas and construction, but even archaeology when when you have this kind of clear map uh, around the world. And then gravity sensors, this is based on measuring differences on, on the gravitational field on the ground. So again, for construction sites, instead of just making a hole and hope for the best, um, what you 
can be sure is that if you're building a new building that you know that there is the right place to, to construct and so yeah it's a uh, it could involve so many different kind of businesses sectors and we are there we are in involving the industry at the same time that we are building the technology so yes and everybody's aware about that and uk was the first one to launch the a national quantum initiative in program uh, in 2013 2014 that was the first phase now we're in the second phase but then a lot of countries follow actually canada and singapore they already created um specific institution on on quantum research um some years ago but then as really national initiative then the quantum flagship in europe was launched in 2018 the same year was the u.s national quantum initiative launch and then uh, different countries have followed so we have now in different countries in europe in asia so this is a global effort this is here we are just talking about public funding so on top of this you have to imagine all the private funding all the corporates that have been putting money on developing the technology so this is really a very interesting ecosystem because it's global. It's again, I always, I always like to say this: this is not a race between two countries. It's a, it's really a, a community effort to to develop the technology, and let's see what happens in in the next years. And uh, we have tried to have the best uh, kind of map on on quantum companies, and this this really develops every week. It's like you really have to be up to date with with what is happening and. Here, just to be clear, we are talking about just quantum companies, so quantum startups. So I'm not talking about an end user like a bank or Airbus that are working on some specific problems in quantum, or I'm not talking about a company that is big like Google. That of course they are, they have a big big effort on on quantum, but they are not a quantum start, a startup. So this is just about startups around the world. And what you see, and I'm very glad to see, is finally we have startups all over the world. And this, this is really amazing. And for the first time uh, in Europe, we have more startups now than in US and Canada together. And if we have a look a little bit closer, this is the percentage of companies per country. So the largest amount is in, is in US, but then UK follow very closely, and this is growing quite fast uh, in UK. I, I must say that it's, it's growing faster than in the US in the last months. Um, then Canada, and then we have uh, France, Germany. Um, and then, again, I think the important message here is not that there are countries with a lot of startups, it's that there are a lot of countries with few startups. And this is a clear message because it means that even for people who have this interest in developing a technology or even looking for a job in any quantum company that you can do it everywhere um, if we talk about sectors so again you remember the classification of technology so it's very very similar the only thing here we are taking into account consulting companies and services um, and then we also separate quantum computing into hardware software and complete solutions there are companies that work just on hardware, other ones, other ones in software, and then there are others that really work on, on kind of the whole package. Um, then we have a, a little bit of enabling technologies here. Um, this is very important, and I'm gonna try to develop this uh, for 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 the future because when we talk about enabling technologies, we are talking about kind of the supply chain technologies, so all kind of technology that has to be part of developing quantum technologies. So we are talking about lasers, um, cryogenics, um, vacuum systems, all these kind of technology that are part of, is not by itself a quantum technology, but it's part of the chain. And, and they, are, they are a key part of the chain. They are a key part of developing this technology. And I think this is also the awareness for a lot of people looking for jobs. It's like, you don't need just to look for jobs in a quantum com computing company or a quantum technology company is also this kind of companies where you your job your role can be really key to develop the, the technology in the future now let's have a look at the use cases and um, here there are just a bunch of them and there are many many others i gave you the happy cows before but i hope that you get a little bit more this kind of feeling how we can use this technology this is mainly about quantum computing and, and optimization problems because it's what so far people have been working on 
the long term and, and try to accelerate the process of how we understand these, these kind of problems. So on drug discovery, if we think about having a full tolerant quantum computer that is able to attain very difficult problems, of course, if you need to make an optimization problem that is um, is is kind of a, like you are you are giving an overview of different parameters, and if you can scan all the possibilities with these parameters in a very short time. This is the way that an optimization problems work. This is a way that it can be used in how to find the best drug, the best uh, vaccine, as, uh, as we know that is very relevant right now. So this is something that several companies around the world are, are really focusing in. And the good thing is that they are working together with the end users, with big pharma companies to, to understand how this can be used. So this is a very, very interesting field. Then in steel manufacturing, so how can you optimize any kind of manufacturing process? And this is, again, a very interesting model because you can apply to almost any industry, any manufacturing industry that you can imagine. Like whatever you are going to make is how can you do the things faster? How can you do, reduce waste or any kind of toxic emission? So this is something that I, I would say in the future probably become one of the most used um, um, yeah, examples or fields of research, like collaboration between industry and, and researchers. Um, in oil and gas, for oil and gas, I give you two, um, two examples. So one will be optimization of how to allocate the resources, and uh, like when you have the information where they are. But another one is how to secure your data using quantum communication. So you know where you can dig, where you have your your reservoir, but then you, you need to secure your data because you don't want that anyone is actually hacking this information. So you have both technologies. And then remember, we also use quantum sensors to have this map of what is underground. So you are using three technologies for a specific sector here. Financial services, I think, is one that a lot of people talk about because uh, you have clear optimization problems there. You can think about risk management, trend optimization, portfolio optimization, and all these kind of problems. Um, so we are supposed to be um, to know how to work with quantum computing. So the way that it works right now is we have people working on quantum algorithms, and then we have people working on what, what they call quantum inspire. It's like you work with classical algorithms or with classical computers and quantum algorithms, and then you see whether you have a specific um, advantage on, on your algorithm. Then on energy, um, I'm going to give you one that, that is, is not here, but I, I think I really like a lot, is when, when you think about the design of windmills, like for, for aeolic uh, renewable energy. So if you think about how to think the, the best profile for your for your blades, you can have this uh, as a kind of optimization problem as well. And there are companies that have been working on that and they already show an advantage. I think it was maybe 3% the um, better results. But imagine 3% is already a lot of money that you can save. Or, so it's, the market is already there. And, and of course, for healthcare, we have seen before when we talk about quantum communication and secure data for healthcare, but we also think about logistics in any kind of hospital and now with the pandemic. So how can you have any kind of optimization problem when you think about the number of beds that you need, depending on the number of um, sick people that come to the hospital? So here you have a big range of different kind of use cases where you think optimization problems is one thing, but then you can use other kind of technology. Um, and we know that there is a clear opportunity. This is uh, what I found the closest, uh, or let's say the best forecast, because it's really hard to have uh, an accurate forecast because, you know, it's a forecast. We, we still don't know how the things are going to develop, but we know the quantum technology market is going to really grow, I would say, almost exponentially in, in the next years. So what we have done is we, we know how the market is going to grow. We map this to the number of jobs that are going to be created. And this is how we came up with this actually exponential curve. And we have seen that in the next 20 years, we are going to create, there are going to be more quantum companies. But well, of course, at one point, you will need so many people working in this new market. So the question is, how can you ensure that you have enough people for these jobs in 20 years? Now, in 20 years, so mostly of those 
people are going to be now in what primary school, high school. So we need to train now people at these levels. We need to bring the awareness at least about quantum technologies to kind of outreach, public engagement, just, just this kind of information about what we are doing that when the time comes and we need these people in 20 years, we have these people ready. But then, as I saw you before, we are, have a market that is growing every week. We have new quantum companies and they are hiring. So the question is, how can we be ensured that now we have the people ready for these jobs? And well, people are talking about this all over the place. I think like three years ago, people were talking about the public funding and now the topic is really the, the quantum workforce. How can we ensure that we don't have any quantum bottleneck? And it's true, I, I can see it. I can tell you that there are so many companies trying to hire and there are no so many people with the right skills to be placed in these quantum jobs. And you could wonder what are these companies because so far you have been, uh, you have present, been presented with an overview of, of what is happening around the world, but these are just some companies around the world. Not only hiring, but um, for you that, that you know who are the, the key players and different kind of technology. Um, again, we are talking about more than 300 companies around the world working in quantum right now. So that's, that's a very interesting ecosystem. Now, we talk about the different kind of technology and then we talk about the different sectors. Now, a little bit different when we talk about the activities where if we classify the different companies. So we have sensing, we have communication. And in communication, I also want to mention that any kind of company that works in cybersecurity, for example, or post-quantum encryption algorithm is going to be part of this quantum communication classification. Then. Of course, we have quantum computing and hardware, and then algorithms and applications, and then these facilitating technologies, as I told you before. And I give you this classification because it's very important when people think about what kind of companies uh, um, they could look for, where they could look for, uh, for a potential job. I think this is the best classification that comes out on, on the activities that the companies focus. So now a little bit about skills. And there has been several papers, and I, I have put here this um, this reference because it's, it's really fresh. I think it was yesterday when I got the final DOI uh, of, of this paper where we, we tried to put together all the information, so I, I'm happy for you to have a look at it. So the question here was really to ask companies, what are the skills that you need? And when you, when you focus on the technical skills, most of the skills that they actually mentioned, they are engineering skills, computer science, math, chemistry. So the question is, is like, do you really need a PhD in quantum physics to be part of a quantum company? And that's the message because it's what a lot of people ask in every career event, in every career panel. People always ask the same, do I need a PhD in quantum? The answer is no. But of course, it always depends on, on the company, on, on the role itself. And I think this is going to change. In the next five years, you will see more and more companies hiring people with a master's, with, with a bachelor's. So far, it's really true that because we are really early stages, we are really early in the development of the technology. So people focus most, mostly on the research and they want researchers, but it doesn't mean that an engineer or a chemist cannot work in, in quantum companies. And, and the key thing here is that there will be a new role and people are already talking about it and it will be quantum engineering. Quantum engineering will be the new engineering that it, they are already masters around the world, but I think in, in the next 10 years, it's gonna be a clearly part of any education program in any country. Another important message here is not just technical skills. And if you ask anyone in any company, they will tell you, I want someone who is motivated, who is um, able to communicate, who has business awareness. Very important because um, a lot of people, they they have been focused on, on the science for so long and then they they go to the interview and I, I, I have heard this several times where people from the companies are saying, they know the science, but they don't know anything about the business. They Their mindset is different. Um, and if you can work, if you're looking for a job in quantum technologies and you, you can work on the, your soft skills, I think that's, um, that wins half the battle. And another important message is not only technical positions, is um, 
it's project management, finance, sales, marketing. So if you have a completely different background but, and you're interested in, in, in learning more about quantum technologies and be part of these emerging markets, you're welcome. Um, a little bit more about, about my company and what we do at Cureca. Um, if you remember this, this kind of stakeholder map that I showed you at the beginning, the, really the, the goal is to create a common language for everyone, so for researchers, for industry, for people in the government and the general public, to so try to bring a common language for everyone that we are ready for this new quantum market, that we can create value, that we can create impact, and at the end that we create business, that is what we want here. So we provide different services. We work with quantum companies on business development. So how can they grow the business? How can they get out there? Who could be their potential customers? But we also work with end users, so banks, um, uh, our space, all the people who are going to use the technology. How can they build a strategy? How can they be part of this new quantum revolution? How, how can they understand what quantum can do in their sector? And, and then, we really focus on training and resourcing, and that's why I talk about skills, because people talk about how difficult it is to have the, the, the candidates with the right skills, and this is really what, what we are trying to build at, at Cureka. So just a, a little bit overview of what we do. On the education side, we have a MOOC platform, so an online training platform where you will have different online courses, very general ones with no mathematics, and then like very technical ones. So we want to kind of, um, if you remember this kind of all education level, so you have primary, secondary school, university, we want to focus in the last level of education. So for people who are ready to go into, into the quantum market and they want to know a little bit more about it, what, what does it mean in, in the financial market? What does it mean for the space sector? And we work together with companies to create this very specific online courses. And then we also create tailored packages for companies. So for example, a software company who would like to, to create a quantum department, how can they kind of develop this strategy on, on their own stuff? We work in, with different companies in some, in some of these projects. Then we have a lot of different webinars and workshops. Um, and when we talk about recruitment, it's not just recruitment as a service. Like if a company is coming to us and say, oh, we're looking for this specific role, do you know of someone? Um, it's really about talking to the people who are looking for the jobs, understanding the skills, if they need any upskilling, if they need any kind of additional education, and otherwise trying to find the best position for them, the dream job for them. So that's how we work really on training and recruitment as, as a whole, what we call the skills platform. We create different, different kind of events, uh, focus on careers, like tutorials at different conferences. And we had a career event two weeks ago now, and it was he was overbooked. It was so loud. It was really, really a success. And we plan to do something similar in the in the coming months again. And it's useful because it was people looking for jobs had the opportunity to sit down and talk to people from companies and ask them, um, "Do you think my profile fit? What do you think I I need to to work for you?" And it was kind of the, the closest chance that you have right now to, to really talk to them and, and really about your fit within their market. Um, we have a lot of information that we put, like a lot of different kind of resources. We have an events calendar, um, a blog. We have uh, links to educational websites, so all kind of information that we think that people need when they want to know more about quantum technologies. And then we build kind of different kind of communities. We focus on technology and on regions so we are creating uh, education packages in different languages so we want again to bring the people together so yeah um, uh, again how, how we work is to, on the training side we partner with companies to create the, the best content that is possible for different relevant for different kind of sector different kind of audience and then on recruitment we work with both individuals looking for jobs and with companies looking for the best candidates we create different kind of events, and uh, yeah, I think that's all. I just want to invite you to join the Quantum Revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And um, so now we've got a quick Q and A session. So if you've got any questions for you and or for Araceli, can you please put them in the chat box, or you can raise your hand and I'll bring you up to the stage to ask your question. And um, just in the meantime, um, Ewan, I don't know if you can start your camera up for me so people can see you. 
Um, I was just wondering, you've talked about kind of quantum 2.0 technologies. Um, how quickly are they going to come to market and how quickly can users such as myself uh, be able to use quantum tech in our everyday lives? That's a very tricky question, Kim. <laughs> I think it depends on the technology again. Um, I don't think I don't think the lay, lay audience there, uh, I don't think my parents are going to use uh, quantum technologies anytime soon. That's really the, the truth. But if you're part of any specific business, any specific sector, I'm sure that there is an application of quantum technologies that maybe nobody thought of at the moment. So it's really like, what is your, what is your market? What is your, yeah, your industry? And how can we uh, apply this to, to your industry? So it's more, I think we are in this phase of raising the awareness and trying to understand the, the use cases. Okay, thank you. Um, Last year, we saw quite a lot about quantum supremacy. It seems quite a contentious topic when it was released. Um, why, why was there so much kind of contention between all of the quantum teams? And what? Uh, maybe I can take this one. Um, so yeah, this was, I guess, alluding to IBM's rebuttal of, quant of uh, Google's um, results. So, you know, this uh, it's hard to see, you know, this, this idea of when is a quantum computer better than a classical one is kind of, it's not, it's not that easy to define. Um, so the way Google did it is they just compared um, for one particular problem, they said, okay, we're going to perform that thing on a classical computer as best as we know. And then, uh, and then we're going to do it on a quantum computer as best as we know. And we're just going to see how long it takes each of them. And I think they, they, uh, they showed that, you know, it would take the the classical computer, you know, years and years to compute this problem, which the quantum computer does. Of course, there's always, and this is what we're finding actually, is that by driving, by saying quantum computers are doing stuff better, people are working quite hard to come up with algorithms for classical computers, which are better so that they can try and top the quantum computer. So we're having this kind of fight between quantum and classical. And this IBM result came out and said, actually, if you change the algorithm slightly, you can do it slightly faster. But I think people were still convinced that, you know, it's a piece of hardware that's beating a supercomputer, which has been developed for the past, you know, 60 years. So it, I think people still saw it as a milestone result. But I think it's nice to show that actually, you know, quantum technologies are kind of creating a competition where it's actually driving innovation in classical technologies as well. So it's good to see. But that was that was where the contention came up. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions from the audience, I'll just have yeah, one more question. Um, what do you think the kind of government in the UK and other governments across the world can do to actually ensure that quantum technologies continues to be driven forward and that we actually end up getting quantum technologies in our phones or something? Really Another tricky question. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you want to well, I mean, maybe this is, but I, I think, uh, which is, I think maybe uh, Q most in QTech would agree that actually the way, at least in the UK, the way innovation is spun out of uh, 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 universities at the moment is quite is quite challenging for lots of people. And I think I, I was really pleased to see from Alatheli side that we ha have a healthy startup culture in in, um, in the UK for quantum, which I think has driven lots of you know lots of stuff in Bristol. I think Bristol is probably one of the key drivers of that metric. Um, but it's not always easy. So I think there can be more support for companies coming out of, of the research because it is always driven by research. And I think it's always beneficial to have a, a healthy and a, a, a symbiotic relationship between universities and startups, which sometimes isn't fostered, I think. Yeah, it's kind of putting more money on the basic science, but also ensuring that there is this kind of application mind and commercializing the technology. They are the, the two sides that have to be, yeah, that they cannot stop if we want to really focus on commercializing the technology at the end. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much to both of you for talking to us today. Um, we're going to take a quick break before we come back for part two, which is looking at Bristol's quantum ecosystem with Professor Noel Linden. So we'll see you back here in about five minutes. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Thank you.